Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Gary Grieve Carlson, and I'm a board member of the Jonathan Bayless Society. I'd like to welcome all of you to the second day of the Bayless Society's 2020 annual conference, which is sponsored by our friends at the Cape Ann Museum, our friends at the Gloucester Writers Center, and of course, by the Jonathan Bayless Society. Today's event is titled Gloucester Quintet, Five Writers, Five Friends. The five writers are Peter Anastas, Garrett Lansing, Jonathan Bayless, Vincent Farini, and Charles Olson, all of whom lived in Gloucester, this remarkable small city on Cape Ann, Massachusetts, and all of whom became friends with one another. Our readers today include another group of five. These are five people who were closely connected in one way or another to each of our five writers. And these five people will be reading from the work of the five writers. To get things underway, I'd like to introduce Ken Rioff, who's going to say a few words about the Gloucester Writer Center. So Ken, would you please unmute yourself? Thanks, Gary, appreciate it. And uh, yes, just wanna welcome everybody and uh, let folks know that uh, the Gloucester Writers Center is uh, proud to be a co-sponsor of this event along with the Cape Ann Museum and the Jonathan Bayless uh, Society. The uh, Gloucester Writers Center is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. We're located in Gloucester at 126 East Main Street. Uh, it's the former home and studio of Vincent Farini. And the center is dedicated to honoring uh, the works of, of, of Farini and of Charles Olson. Uh, the center also houses the uh, Maud Olson uh, library of over 3,000 volumes uh, uh, at, at its uh, center there on East Main Street. It, since its founding in 2010, the uh, center has hosted hundreds of uh, readings and class classes, lectures, uh, films, and uh, has had uh, writers in residence uh, as well as community meetings. So uh, again, we are uh, very proud to be part of this. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing to you Leslie Morris, who is the uh, Gore Vidal Curator of Modern Books and Manuscripts uh, at the Houghton Library. That's the primary uh, rare book and manuscript uh, repository at Harvard University, uh, where she also oversees the Jonathan Bayless papers, among other literary and uh, historic archives. She's a graduate of Northwestern University and the University of Chicago, the University of Leeds, and she has also worked briefly in the antiquarian uh, book trade uh, before uh, becoming curator of rare books and manuscripts at the Rosenbach Museum and Library in Philadelphia. She's uh, been at Houghton since uh, 1992. And I, uh, again, uh, turning it over to uh, Leslie. Uh, if you're there, unmute yourself and uh, We'll see you folks later in the story. Thanks so much for that lovely introduction. And I'm honored and delighted to be part of this celebration of these five writers drawn together serendipitously by the town of Gloucester in the 50s and 60s. For them, Gloucester was a special place where writing and life could be happily combined. And that love of Gloucester comes through in their writing. They gathered often in each other's homes to discuss writing, politics, and of course, Gloucester. From what I've read, unfortunately, I never met them. They were all big talkers, and so those occasions must have been quite lively. Most writers prefer that you focus on their work, not their life, and you'll be hearing their words in just a moment. My role here today is to give you just a little bit of context about each writer's life. Peter Anastas was the youngest of the group, born in Gloucester in 1937. After graduating from Bowdoin College, he went to Italy, where he studied medieval literature and worked as a translator. But Gloucester drew him back in 1962, and he took a master's degree in literature at Tufts. He had a successful career as a freelance writer and journalist. While working on his first book on the Penobscot Nation, 
he became deeply committed to anti-poverty activism. He joined Action Inc., Gloucester's anti-poverty agency, in 1972 and was a social worker there for 30 years. He published nine books, largely on aspects of Gloucester's history and a novella. He died last December, aged 82. Jonathan Bayliss was born in Arlington, Massachusetts in 1926. He spent a year at Harvard, then enlisted in the US Navy and ended up finishing college at Berkeley. He moved back east with his wife and family in 1956, settling in Gloucester. He was skilled in accounting and management and in the 1960s became controller at Gordon's of Gloucester, the frozen fish company. But all the time he was working, he was writing. Two plays based on the Gilgamesh epic and a monumental four volume, 2000 plus page novel called Gloucesterman. At the age of 46, a grant allowed him to leave Gordon's to devote himself to writing. When that money ran out, he worked as an executive aide and then treasurer for the city of Gloucester, retiring in 1985 to return to full-time writing. He died in 2009 while putting the finishing touches to the final volume of his novel. Vincent Farini was born in Saugus, Massachusetts in 1913. Self-educated at the Lynn Public Library, he worked for General Electric and as a frame maker, but from childhood, his ambition was to be a poet. He published his first book of poems at age 27 and over the course of his life, produced 31 volumes of poetry, four plays and an autobiography. He moved to Gloucester in the 1940s. He was a frequent speaker at city council meetings, opposing developments that he thought would destroy the character and spirit of his beloved Gloucester. He died in 2007 at the age of 94, his obituary calling him Gloucester's Poet Laureate. Garrett Lansing was born in Albany, New York in 1928. He grew up in Cleveland, but moved east to attend Harvard in 1945. His classmates there included the artist Edward Gorey and fellow poets Frank O'Hara and John Ashbery. From there, he moved to New York, where he enjoyed a very active social life that included meeting the Gloucester inventor John Hayes Hammond Jr., who prompted his move to Gloucester in the 1960s. He was fascinated by the occult and opened a bookstore specializing in magic and philosophy. But his true calling was poetry, through which he explored social, spiritual, and natural engagement with the world. He died in 2018 at the age of 89. And lastly, the eldest of the five, and perhaps the best known, Charles Olson. Born in 1910 in Worcester, Massachusetts, he spent summers in Gloucester, which became his adopted hometown. He attended Wesleyan and then Harvard. His first poems were written in the 1940s, and throughout the 40s and 50s, he worked on his experimental opus, The Maximus Poems, an exploration of American culture set in Gloucester. His essay, Projective Verse, was published in 1950 and influenced a generation of poets, as did his seven years at the socially progressive Black Mountain College. When Black Mountain closed in 1956, Olson moved to Gloucester, which from then on remained the center of his life and work. He died in 1970, only 59 years old, while completing the third volume of the Maximus poems. But enough of biography, let's now hear some of their words. And to introduce our readers today, I'd like to introduce Gary Grieve Carlson. Gary is professor of English at Lebanon Valley College in Pennsylvania. 
He attended Bates College in Maine and holds a PhD from Boston University. He met and became friends with Jonathan Bayless in 1999, knew Peter Anastas, and is the author of several essays on Charles Olson, so definitely qualified to introduce these readers. So Gary, unmute yourself and over to you. Thank you, Leslie. Our first reader this afternoon is Judy Walcott, who retired in 2014 after more than 20 years of teaching at the Adult Learning Center at North Shore Community College. Judy knew Peter and Astis when they were teenagers in Gloucester, and they reconnected 30 years later when Judy moved back to Gloucester. Judy and Peter were partners for more than 30 years. So Judy, would you please unmute yourself? Thank you very much, Gary. Um, I would like to begin by reading just a little background from Peter, the book that Peter edited, The Letters of Charles Olson uh, to the Gloucester Daily Times. And there's a foreword in it by Garrett Lansing. But it gives a little context of the quintet. So Gary, uh, Leslie has said that Olson came, left Ma uh, Black Mountain in 1956. So the next six years in Olson's life, 1957 to 1963, were among his most productive. But these Gloucester years were crucial, both for Olson and for his work. They were also crucial for the friendships he made here or had returned to consolidate. Always there was the primary one with Vincent Perini, then coming intensely into his own as a poet. Quote, my brother poet, my twin, end quote. Olson often called Perini. There were men like poet Garrett Lansing and artist Harry Martin, men whom Olson saw almost daily in a dialogue that was absolutely germane to his work. It was Jonathan Bayless, writer and businessman. Olson once said that Bayless was the only person in America who understood him completely. They loved to talk politics together, especially Democratic Party politics. And I bet those would be interesting conversations today. And now I want to read from A Walker in the City, which was Peter's last published book. And it is A Walker in the City Elegy for Gloucester, it's a compilation of his column that he wrote for the Gloucester Daily Times. Autumn in the Voice of the Owl. A week ago, just after the equinox and the precipitous change in the weather wrought by the passage of Hurricane Hugo, I awoke from a sound sleep to the voice of a great horned owl. It was around 4 a.m. and the minute I heard the familiar call, I got out of bed and opened my windows, regardless of the cold air. The arrival in early summer of residents who occupy the many seasonal cottages in my neighborhood, along with all the boat traffic in the Anasquam River, usually drives the owls and much of other wildlife away. Come September or October, the skunks and raccoons become more public. The great blue herons fish openly in the marshes of Mill River, and the black crowned night heron flies again. But nothing signals fall from me like the hooting of the great horned owl, for it says that the woods and fields of Cape Ann are theirs again, and while we sleep, they dominate the night. Goldenrod and asters, pink and violet, color the roads and byways of Essex County. The purple loose strife of August has grown, given way to September's burnished marsh grass. Amazing late trickery grows along Poplar Street by Oak Hill Cemetery. Swamp maples blaze and elderberries abound. Already the warblers have left along with the swallows. The flickers, 
incandescent in their newly molded migrating colors, rush to feed before departing. Catbirds linger, but the robins are long gone. Squirrels gather the abundance of this season's acorns and black walnuts. The woodchucks grow fat and sleek. Rabbits have unmown lawns to themselves. Monarchs arrive at Brace Cove and Eastern Point on this leg of their southward migration. And overhead at night, the great bear wheels dipping over lower into Ipswich Bay. But except for a loon or two stopping over on its way from the lakes and ponds of New Hampshire to the South Atlantic waters, the night world belongs to the great horned owl. Hugo's winds, if only briefly, blew the clouds from the sky, shaking the leaves in the oaks like shamanic rattles, and the harvest moon stood unveiled in all its melancholic beauty, along with the constellations of the equinoctial sky. You may smell autumn in the rich hummus of roadside weeds. You may taste it in the apples of Ipswich or West Newbury. You may feel it in the morning's nip or the dampness of early evening, but you only hear it in the voice of the owl, who appropriates both the night and the season of the soul's declension, which is fall. When I first moved into my neighborhood 21 years ago, the owl shared the night with a family of foxes whose musky odor and yapping cries were just about all you knew of them, except for a fleeting glimpse of Auburn as they bounded across the open meadows near the house. Once I counted nine pheasants in my very yard, then there were only two, and the foxes had long disappeared. The meadow was cleared of its cover of underbrush and briar for a subdivision that was never built, and the pheasants left for good. So the owl is my only connection with what is truly wild in the primeval sense. That which stirs our blood, firing our imaginations, and peopling our dreams, indeed, waking us out of them to the ineffable as it actually lives. I get the same feeling when I see a marsh hawk gliding overhead and sense the eerie stillness of, in the air. The tension in nature, at least creatures hide from it at, or freeze in their tracks. But we are not separate from these powerful reminders of nature's richness of life forms. There are no boundaries between us. Each of us is the other, the owl, the fox, the pheasant and the hawk. We breathe the same air and drink the same water. And those who live in the woods and swamps that surround us save us as much as we would protect their ability to live and procreate. They recall to us that wildness in which as Thoreau believed lies the preservation of the world. For it is in our own wild nature that responds to the owl's return in autumn. And when we deny or flee from their nature, we deny that, that what is best and realest in ourselves, whether we know it or not. Gloucester Daily Times, October 3rd, 1989. Thank you. Thank you, Judy, you read that beautifully. Our second reader today is Victoria Mattingly, who is the daughter of Jonathan Bayless. Victoria grew up in Gloucester, where she came to know all five of today's writers. And then she went off to the University of Chicago and later traveled in Europe, India, North Africa, and the Middle East before eventually landing in Travis City, Traverse City, Michigan. Victoria, would you please unmute yourself? Yes, hello. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm going to read a um, part, the beginning of a chapter in this book, Glostermus, uh, which is the last of the four novels um, of, of the Glosterman series. And this is chapter 18 called Isle of Man, Mid-June. One morning, Faye Gabriel rode the commuter train into Botolph to join a colloquium 
on the Anthropological Philosophy of Religion at the Norumbega Theological School in Unabridge. An ample honorarium provided by the Arnheim Foundation had overcome her reluctance to waste time in her preciously remaining intellectual life for the mere honor of representing heterodoxy within an obscure interdisciplinary profession. Her retirement's disposable income was wholly absorbed by the debtless equanimity of the steady state she had chosen, which provided for reasonable contingencies, all necessary insurance included, in a convenient situation on an interesting joint hill. But still, it was a fixed income with no margin for extravagance. Non-recurrent honorariums offered occasional liberalities. Sorties to the mainland by rail were rare for her nowadays. Even when she'd lived in Dogtown half a century earlier as a married hospital nurse and for a short time before the birth of her first child, it was her husband who'd done the regular shuttling to Botolf for classrooms in the Norumbega Garth. Probably, she alone among the jaded or constitutionally incurious passengers who would eventually board this train en route had never worn out her appreciation of the Dogtown branches scenery. Though even she took no pleasure with her return ticket when it was dark and the poorly lighted, hardly heated, bumpy cars seemed dangerously decrepit or sullenly slow in the intervals between drawn out debarkations of ravenous students and weary office workers, while chattering was impatiently silenced. Especially on the last protracted inland stretch before Dogtown Central Station, in unavoidable journeys home after dark, in a coach all but emptied, she would find herself shivering almost alone with nameless apprehension as she gathered her things and rose from her seat too soon and stood at the vestibule door as if she might miss the stop and a last taxi only to be swept helplessly past her destination on the coda of the Dogtown branch, a single track curving north through the hills to its absolute terminal at Land's End, usually with no more than two or three other lorn souls in a rattling capsule of safely evacuated ghosts and their litter. But the morning ride into the metropolis was otherwise in mood. As much as possible, she therefore planned her round trip errands and appointments for a repetition of the Eastern seascape views, sitting to the starboard, eastbound, northerly to home in the PM, leaving the glare of descending suns to passengers across the aisle, instead of sitting on the port side, as she now did in the AM, westbound to the south, as she adjusted with her left hand any necessary shading of the warmly ascendant sun that lighted her side of the aisle through a tolerably functional window, dirty or merely scratched, as its angle fluctuated with the sinuous course of the tracks. But in either direction, whatever the time of day, since steam engines had long since been retired and passenger windows sealed for nominal air conditioning, she sometimes still tried to recall the acrid scent of cinders borne with the smoke of coal and wafted lubrication oil. On her right, as the train cautiously approached the Dogtown draw, it passed the modern low brick building of the Daily News plant and its parking lot, which had dis displaced a coal yard with many pockets, served by railroad hopper cars on a side track that no longer existed. And then the gutted and abandoned walls of the Dogtown Smithy and Iron Works on the deserted bank of the Namouche estuary below, 
to gather speed on the straightaway across salt marshes to West Parish. But in half a century, not much had changed for the rich or the poor, or for industrial architecture, in phase view from the left side of the right-hand track on a lovely green and blue day on the way to Botolph's North Station. Yet the route was still so familiar from the distant past that she no longer watched at every minute of motion along landscape, seascape, and shabby urban walls beside, above, or beneath aged public superstructures. Early in the journey, she opened her morning Botolph orb as the train entered the longest uninteresting passage of the Dogtown branch through nearly uninhabited backwood hills to the open coastline and its offshore islets beginning at Felicity by the sea. There, she no longer could bear to read news of Roland Reagan's rerouted Protestican power, but her eye was caught on an inner page by the cryptic report of a young youth club leader in one of the suburbs who'd set fire to a seagull, insisting that his young followers pay attention to his feet. There was no report of the aftermath. The newspaper dropped to her lap, and for much of the rest of the one-hour trip, she stared out her window, scarcely conscious of what she saw. Thank you. Thank you, Vicki. Our next reader today is Owen Farini, who is the son of Vincent Farini. Owen helped out at his father's frame shop in Gloucester, and then went on to Tufts University, after which he lived in Italy for several years. Owen, would you please unmute yourself? Thank, thank you, Gary. I'm going to read a little bit about Vincent's um, biography in his early years. Okay, this is from this is from this, this book, Vincent Ferrini, the whole song, introduction. Benanzio Ferrini was born to Rina De Carlo and Giovanni Ferrini in Saugus, Massachusetts on June 24th, 1913. He grew up poor in the brickyard section of nearby Lynn, the hub of America's shoemaking industry. While Lynn had originally depended on the production methods of small individual artisan shops, they had given way to the machine-based factory system. The proud and self-sufficient artisan had was replaced by the industrial worker. Conditions of life were grim. I am guarding my baby sister in her high chair by the stove. When it explodes, kills her, gashes my arm and forehead. My brother Dante under the stove escaping, he recalls. I am crying my heart out. What are we going to do about Yolanda? What are we to be without her? The doctor stitching my arm up in the corner of my eye. That was always with, with that, that, that memory was always with Vincent. So that was a very sad time. The next poem is Ellis Island rediscovered when um, Vincent's parents came from Italy to Ellis Island in New York. Okay. Ellis Island rediscovered. The bird, the fish, Ferrini, on the graffiti wall of the examination room of Ellis Island, the fish is drawn in blue chalk by the health inspector, 1907. When my parents came over on separate boats in third class steerage, the bird about to fly away to freedom here with the fish, the eye of the pyramid, taking in the pilgrims, the Puritans, the oncoming immigrants, the foreign sounding minorities becoming the majority as we start again with the solitaire in the church of the fisher folk and I in the languages of shoes and fishes. This next poem is a city, Lynn, Massachusetts, and Lynn was really, 
big industrial city, like a lot of the, a lot of the cities in, in Massachusetts near Water Power, Lawrence and Lowell and Holyoke, really major industrial cities with lots of immigrant workers, okay? So the city, Lynn, Massachusetts. 15 years ago, this city was a shoe hub of the world. 160 factories hummed a song of joy. Jobs so plentiful, you tripped over them. And our families had happiness. Today, the city is a graveyard of factories, monumental tombstones accusing with broken eyes, a jungle of death pregnant with another life, and we shoe workers highly mushroom the union halls arguing. Skeptical of the future, we talk of the past, of the crowded union meetings, the honest speeches and inspiring guts to sacrifice, the monster demonstrations and the unbreakable strikes. Six months ago, the last giant factory said, accept a 20% cut. The union answered no. The boss grabbed his shop and settled out of the state leaving 1,700 families stranded. The union caved in. At dawn, buses and cars carrying shoe workers to faraway open shop towns, and we thousands remaining huddled in tenements, starved in the shadows of dead factories. It's kind of interesting, that's, that story kind of repeats itself even, even today. Um, so, um. All right, these next two poems, were written when Vincent was still living in Lynn, and this is copyright date 1947. It's a little booklet called The Infinite People. It's kind of a really interesting little booklet. Um, this poem is called Homeland. I love the gray green boulders that invite you to their porches, the black fallow soil friendly as a warm handshake, the hills bare and sparse of grass, like the hairless hide of an old dog, and the trees, gnarled and rooted, undiscovered people with wisdom in their back pockets, and the sea that is our breath. Oh, I love this land with a grip of iron. The next poem from, from the same book of Songs from a Dawning Country. Under the cover of the lifting dark, I am come from the center of the universe, from the center of the atom, from the center of the mind the sleepless inquirer, to sow the truth in the waiting ground, to, to sprout roses in the pay envelopes, to unmask inequities, to impale the devils of ignorance, to bring miracles to the unhealthy, to give ideas to the hungry, and to discover ourselves to one another. I sing from street corners, marketplaces, from union halls, the kitchens of tenements, wherever workers gather. I sing of the new science, which is to unlock the people from the diseases of insecurity. I sing of the unbelievable wonders to be. Okay. And then we moved to Gloucester in 1948. And this next poem, The Flood Time of Fishing, is about Gloucester and, and, and the fishing industry, okay? Once there were so many ships in the harbor, you couldn't see the ocean. One family had 25. Today they run a junkie. Another combine controlled 40 and more. Now they unload from foreign vessels, morgue fishes. Morgue fishes are frozen fish from foreign countries. There were so many masts, you couldn't see the houses nor the skies sailing home over the round horizon. Ah, the still glowing eyes of those fishermen in bars and taverns. Oil skins and rubber gear dominating the water. The boxed in fears, the chain songs, the lamprey company union, even the streets were slimy with scales. It was a city of mammoth barrels and quicksilver bullion. This next poem, it's about fish cutters. When we lived in downtown Gloucester, our neighbors across the street, um, the White family, the mother was a fish cutter. And I remember her with her, her, her white outfit and her, her white hairnet. I remember her really well. Fish cutters. The scales of the dawn stick to the skin of the cutters ankle deep in fish eyes. White bony skeletons sleep with them and follow them back to these wharves. 
wet with the smell of old love that anchors them to the innumerable fish that come forth perpetually and is their breathing. The last poem is a short poem. It's kind of really nice. It's sort of, it's, 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 it's a real Vincent poem. Okay, the gold. The sunless flowers have startles the ear with the fire and ether as we do. Whoops. I'll, I'll, start that, I'll start that again. There was a, the sunless flowers have startles the ear with the fire and ether as we do with what is ours because we are the gardeners of each other. Okay, that's it. Thank you. All right, thanks. Thank you. Thanks very much, Owen. Those were really well chosen selections. Thank you. Welcome. Our next reader this afternoon is Derek Fenner, who was for many years a very close friend of Garrett Lansing. Derek holds a Master in Fine Arts from the Jack Kerouac School of Disembodied Poetics at Naropa University. And he works and lives now on the far western slope of the Sierra Nevada in Northern California. Derek, could you please unmute yourself? Absolutely. It is the truest and most certain thing of all things. That which is above is as that which is below, and that which is below is as that which is above, to accomplish the one thing of all things most wonderful. Ascend from earth to heaven and descend again to earth and thou wilt have accomplished the potency of things superior and of all things inferior. The sun was its father, the mother, the moon. It was born in the wind's belly. It is the strong power of every power for it overcomes all things subtle and penetrates all things gross. Thence proceed many marvelous adaptations which were established in this wise. It is thus the world was created. For this reason, men call me thrice greatest because I have three parts of the philosophy of the whole world. This is all I have to say concerning the mystery of the one thing. So first I just wanna give gratitude to the Cape Ann Museum, the Gloucester Writers Center, and the Jonathan Bayless Society for pulling this together. Um, what I just read was a little bit from the Emerald Tablet, or it was the whole Emerald Tablet um, by Hermes. And since I'm reading for Garrett, I just think it's really important for people to know how much Garrett was really just adept at laying books on people when they needed them. Um, and sometimes when they didn't know they needed them. And in fact, in our second meeting, I can remember him handing me Prologos by Jonathan Bayless and saying, I really want to know what you think about this, um, which started a whole level of, of diving into Jonathan's work. Um, but also just understanding, you know, we had a lot of intersecting interests and our interest in alchemy was really a great conversation topic. And he said, well, you should really be reading Blake's version of the Emerald Tablet or what he had access to. And um, interestingly enough, he handed me this book on our third meeting, um, and it's just S. Foster Damon's William Blake, His Philosophy and Symbols. Uh, but interestingly enough, the version that he gave me was published, um, originally the book was published in 1924. This version was published in 1958 um, by Peter Smith out of Gloucester, Massachusetts. So just a nice, another version of just how Gloucester keeps coming into the, the circle and the fold. So I just like to read a few poems. I'm going to read from um, Garrett's The Heavenly Tree Grows Downward, the first um, printing of this book, um, of his lifelong book. And this is the 1966 Matter Press version uh, or Matter Books. And then I'll be concluding with a couple poems from Heavenly Tree Northern Earth, published by Nor North Atlantic in 2009. Um, also just want to say that, you know, also with Garrett, the many walks we would take around Gloucester when I first got to Gloucester, I was living in Lowell at the time and how he would just point to a hillside or point to, a, you know, we're walking down some old road and there's just some remains and he would start reciting Olson from Maximus and all of a sudden those poems that I had read for many years were coming to life. Um, and all the readings that I attended in Vincent Ferrini's old house, um, always seeing Peter 
Anastas there and having great conversations, him knowing I came from Lowell saying, how's Kerouac's Lowell? And, you know, which Greek restaurant have you eaten at recently? And just all these wonderful memories of, of all of these men. And I only got to meet a couple of them, um, but all of them very important. Um, so I just want to start with just uh, very quickly, the, the beginning of this book has an introduction by the Massachusetts poet John Wieners. And I think it speaks very highly of Garrett's work, you know, even in its first publishing. Uh, and John says, rhythm is that elegance of thought the Greeks called paradise in their apple orchards. It is that flowering of thought so many petals blow through the mind, the wind of imagination. This is not a book of poems to read by, it is to live with. The heavenly tree does grow downward into the mind, new thought. It is a cleansing perfection we encounter without the poet knowing it. Let us hope he continues. Complexity of perfection is found here, simple, pure, and purposeful. The complications of formal statement of familial relations would be diminished if we were to remain naked longer in our lives. Without them, we would be naked too, but in a different way. These poems force us to this. I thank their presence and their creator in my room. Now I have to learn to carry them with me over the streets of the city and dismay the madness of a nation with their magic. The heavenly tree grows downward. Who bury the dead must from the grave establish a habit. Who bury the dead lead forth the bride stainless in dress. The morning glory creeps stone lizard, who bury the dead in fetal position, knees pulled up to chin, who bury the dead to rise again. Anasquam Nights, I tell you it was real, bayberry bushes on the hill, the house, yellow moon and simple love, but oh, fox laughter from the woods, the white fox running through the pines. the castle of flowering birds. Fancy in mine, the graceful flaunters of summer air arise like flowers from their sea, bodies bronze and fledged in blue, uniforms that music wears, when most she is herself, not sound, only, but fugitive and sly, the fox occult among the grapes, anonymous in summer's horn. Brilliant beyond a self, the birds are dumb with feeling, an afternoon of wings, the company of love, safe in the garden that is themselves, more ghost than garden, more brute than bird, acclaim the throbbing animal, the beastly petals green with blood. In Northern Earth, the graveyard overgrown and memory effaced, cats of many colors run among the sumac that roots in human stomachs long gone back to long enduring earth and what its length of days or seasons in astronomy of death. Endurance is calamity if earth speaks true and the measurement of time is not posterity. How the line must lengthen while the sun endures and the poem report advanced celebrity. Dissolve, coagulate, the chemists say, but the first darkness blinds the human eyes that climb the ladder of the visionary spinal cord to issue in the thousand petaled sun. one of the company of light. The star man in my heart is young and moves with all the strength memory masters. Shoots as a soldier in the boyhood game was supposed to. That brilliant and keen, he is the might of doom of the stalwart, the heart of men defending Maldoon. He is untarnished. He moves in the untold vigil of the children of others, the warrior behind the dollar of actual war game stupidity. Lucent, he is nothing lacking. He is eminence fixed in the coldest blue eyes. He is white and renews the ancient Florasians. Supple and amorous, he desires Christ and Achilles be one. And in the golden fields, he sees them drink from one cup, naked and hot in the heat of the sun. And I'd just like to close um, with Garrett's poem in the American Forest as our American forest in the West are burning from climate change 
um, which all of the poets today have, have spoken to, I believe, um, over their lifetimes, many years before it became what it has come to. Um, certainly our polis is smoke today. In the American forest, the blessed vacant mine inane, no water course of tumbling thoughts, formerly rare in American forests, 16th to 19th century, and now comes to recognize itself, its value, burden of Nagarjuna. Gluskop was busy, no time to be empty, working, fighting, shaping, that the animals be smaller than his original error he made them, adapting all to human universe. The condition is superordinate, 20th century, a new dogma nears, who hails the Superman I attend. It is not love one speaks of here, rather gods known to us by similar name. See them bend their bows. Aye, aye, they are sighting their human targets. We try to forfend such malification who identify mistaking secondary personalization as if it were actual and private. No privacy left, nor should be. En plein jour all feeling, reclamation as of American forest. Indian is no accidental word. The Indies are connected west and east in mind, subsuming in concurrence as of Greece, Sicily, Europe, and America, Amerindia, India, the bitter flow. The forest first philosophers, emerging now and again as forests disappear, intone the path of life and death and life, the gates ajar, a jewel, and morning mirrored red. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. Well done, well done. Our final reader today is Charles Olson who is the son of the poet Charles Olson. Charlie lives in Gloucester with his wife and they have just sent their daughter off to Middlebury College in Vermont. Charlie's worked as a carpenter for his whole life and he owns a boat that he enjoys spending time on. So Charlie, would you please unmute yourself? A couple of poems out of Maximus I'd like to read you. Um, the first is uh, being on the ocean. Um, it's called The First Letter of George's, on George's, and uh, it'll make you tremble because it makes me tremble. Um, February night or August on George's, the seas are short, the rooms small. When the moon's fullest, the tidal currents set fastest. On the morning of four, uh, February 14th, we started in and 24 hours were on the rocky bottom of the southerly part of the bank. A hundred sails were crowded in together, half a mile and some a mile apart, hand lighting where the cod spawn. The fishing and the weather were good for days, although the cold was intense. We were at the rail sometimes a full hour without changing position. Then if we got a halibut, the cook would bring up a pancake with plums in it to celebrate and coffee. The vessel shifted its berth twice in the first week, each time drawing near the body of the fleet. The fish were more plentiful, but with each move our concern grew for we were all bunched up easterly of the dreaded South Shoal. If the weather stayed fine, there was no danger, but if it came on a gale and even one vessel dragged on her anchor or chafed her cable and went adrift, we might all go. At sundown on the 24th, there was a sudden change. The clouds massed and the rising wind roughened up the seas. At eight o'clock, the skipper was uneasy. He kept looking at the sky and the horizon the wind had veered to the northeast and it was increasing. It began to snow, moderately at first and then more. The skipper went forward to examine the cable and gave orders to pay out 10 fathom. <clears throat> Our lights in the rigging had been lit since sundown and the rest of the fleet could still be seen. When the skipper warm, warning that the night would be a watch for all of us, advised those who could to get some sleep. We went below about half past eight. It 
was now about 11 o'clock. The wind was a gale and the snow came down spitefully <clears throat> and the seas were so high we could do nothing but look up the sides of them. From the shortest break of them in these confines of George's, the way they snapped themselves off, one of them could break aboard us and sweep everything over the rail to leeward or worst coming in too big, set down on us, bury us, smother the vessel under its weight and take it and us down in one crush. <clears throat> At midnight, the tide itself changed, set towards shoal water. And now the wind and the seas and the tide were in one movement from the northeast. And the gravest strain was put upon all the vessels trying to ride out that night. We were on deck to keep what looked, what lookout we could for the first vessel, which might loose itself and drive on to us. The oldest hand aboard was in the windlass with a hatchet ready to cut the cable if paying it out wasn't fast enough to let a vessel by and we had to go ourselves. The darkness had become impenetrable and a more dismal night none of us have ever passed. We longed for morning to dawn. Once in a while the storm would lull for a little and then the snow would not fall so thickly. Then we would see some of the lights in the fleet nearest us, but this was not often. During the night, a large vessel did pass quite near us. We could see her lights, also her spars and sails, as she was driven swiftly along. We trembled at the thought of what might she have done had she struck us. And when we learned of the terrible disaster of the gale, <clears throat> we spoke of this vessel as the cause of some portion of it. At length, the east began to lighten. Morning was coming. Our danger was not over, but the gale continued. But there was comfort to the light. The fearful darkness and the terrible uncertainty was relieved. We could now at least see our position. We had something to eat in turns. <clears throat> when about nine o'clock, the skipper sang out, a vessel adrift just ahead of us. All eyes were on her. She came directly for us. A moment more and we would have had to cut when she passed with the swiftness of a gull. So near any one of us could have leaped aboard her. We watched her as she went on. and a short distance astern, she struck one of the fleet and we saw the waters close over, close over both vessels almost instantly. As we looked, they both disappeared. Our own anchor began to drag and we yaw. This was dangerous in the extreme, for if the anchors did not take hold again, find new bottom, we too must cut and one adrift go as those others had. Fortunately, the anchor bit up, found holding ground, and we rode again in safety. <clears throat> All through the day of the 25th, we watched two more vessels bore down on us, but were clear and we were saved. The sun down, the gale moderated, and the terror of it, which had a sweep so fearfully over Georgia's was over. The next day we were back at fishing. We fished through the week, had good fishing, and headed home. Eastern Point Light, when she first sighted, looked good to us, but coming in by the fort, the crowds of people waiting there to see each vessel's name awoke it all again. Several came on board asking if we had seen such and such a vessel since the gale. The town was in commotion. Such anxiety I hope never again to witness. The wharves were full of broken ships and there was hardly a home which did not have a loss. The gloom was general over the town for many days. 120 men had drowned that one night and day <clears throat> and 15 vessels gone down all on George's the shoal of Georges, the north, the west, and the south. But these are both out of Maximus. Um, this other one <coughs> is not a lot <coughs> nicer, but um, it's at least on land. <laughs> um, so uh, this one is called Coles Island. And uh, uh, it's about this, no, it's a little shorter. So I'll read this one. Um, uh, 
I met Death, and he was a sportsman on Coles Island. He was a property owner. Or maybe Coles Island was his. I don't know. The point is, I was there walking, <clears throat> and as it often is in the woods, a stranger showing up, suddenly showing up, makes the very thing you were doing no longer the same. That is suddenly what you thought when you were alone and doing what you were doing. Changes because someone else shows up. He didn't bother me or say anything, which is not surprising. A person might not in the circumstance, circumstances or at most a nod or something, but they would, but they wouldn't, or you wouldn't think of it either if it was death. And he certainly was the moment I saw him. There wasn't any question about that, even though he may have looked like a sort of country gentleman going about on his own land. Not quite, not it being he. A fowler maybe, as though <clears throat> he was used to hunting birds and was out this morning keeping his hand in, so to speak, moving around, noticing what game were about and how they seemed and how the woods were. As a matter of fact, just before he had shown up, so, shown up so naturally, as another person might walk up on a scene of your own, I had noticed a cock and a hen pheasant cross easily the road I was on and had tried, in fact, to catch my son's attention quick enough for him to see it before they did walk off into the bayberry or arbor bitey along the road. My impression is, as we did that, is death and myself regard each other. <clears throat> and there wasn't anything more than that. Only that he had appeared and we had recognized each other. Or I did him. And he seemed to have no question about my presence there, even though I was uncomfortable. That is, Coles Island is a queer and isolated gated place. And I was only there by will to know more of the topography of it lying as it does out over the Essex River. And as it is now, as and as it now is, with no tenants that one can speak of, it's more private than almost any place one might imagine. And down in that part of it where I did meet him, about halfway between the two houses over the river and the carriage house at the entrance. It was quiet and as much a piece of the earth as any place can be. But my difficulty when he did show up was immediately at least that I was an intruder. And by being there at all, and yet even if he seemed altogether used to Coles Island, and like I say, as though he owned it, even if I wasn't sure he didn't, I noticed him and he me. And he went on without anything extraordinary at all. Maybe he had gaiters on or almost a walking stick. In other words, much more habit, habited than I was only in chinos actually and only doing what I had set myself to do here and in other places on Cape Ann. It was his eye perhaps which makes me render him as death. It isn't true. There wasn't anything that different about his eye. It was not one thing more than that he was death instantly that he came into sight or that I was aware there was a person here as well as myself and my son. We did exchange some glance and that is the fullest account I can give of the encounter. Do I have time to read one little short more one? I've got a little one that will be 
We'll call this my legacy poem. Uh, November 18th, 1965. My mother had died and my father and I were, I'd come to visit him over in his house. I lived elsewhere then. Um, so I think he might've written this around that time. Uh, tall in the fort, my son and I, the fortune said, my son leagues off and I hide here on the little hill, all the world close and far away. Fortune, but fixed will, foreknowledge absolute and wings of chance, filthy do, nothing given, all that one cares for proven and come true. Thank you, Charlie for giving us these poems and for reading them with such feeling. Uh, our session ends at three o'clock, it's three o'clock now. Uh, so I would like to thank all of our five readers um, as well as Ken and Leslie and Catherine. Um, our readers did a splendid job, I think. Let me thank also before we go, our sponsors, the Cape Ann Museum, the Gloucester Writers' Center, and thanks to all of you for joining us um, for this event. Thank you. <laughs>